So hello and welcome to everyone, to both of you that are here in, in person and also the audience that is online. Welcome to the second day of our uh, big conference co-organized by the ETUI and the ETUC, a blueprint for equality. Um, welcome to this panel on minimum income schemes. Uh, a big thank you to, to our speakers today for, for being with us. Um, a big thank you also to our speakers online, to our speaker online. And I'm sorry, Daniel, if this is a bit of a rough start because you're an hour before us. Um, I hope it's okay. Um, I'm going to introduce them to you. Daniel Clegg, he's a senior lecturer in social policy at the University of Edinburgh. Kaina Rabai, I'm so sorry, Kaina. Um, she is policy and advocacy coordinator at the APN, a European anti poverty network. Sarah Marshall is a researcher at the University of Antwerp, and Ilaria Madama is associate professor at Università degli Studi di Milano. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we kick start. So I'm, I'm sure those of you that are online should be already familiar with how Zoom works, but just for the sake of it, um, you, you can ask the questions in the Q&A function at the very bottom of the screen. And for those of you that are in the room, we'll circulate a mic at the very end of the session for, for a Q&A. Okay, so um, I would actually have a, a first question for, for Sarah, if that's okay. And I, it's, it's, it's a big question, but if you could just give us a snap of the general trends of minimum income schemes in Europe, and perhaps you could cover adequacy coverage. Um, that, would be, that would be fantastic. Okay. Uh I'll uh, try. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, at the Center for Social Policy in at the University of Antwerp, where uh, where I work, uh, we uh, maintain a data set that tries to track the adequacy of minimum income protection packages and and trends uh, in minimum income protection packages. Uh, what we do is that we don't focus on, on the base rates of social assistance schemes, of minimum income protection schemes, but that we calculate uh, for hypothetical households the actual net disposable income to which they are entitled. So that has a number of advantages uh, in the sense that um, means tests differ between countries. So in this sense, we know uh, w whether net disposable income is higher for those with children because they are entitled to child benefits or whether they don't get uh, additional child benefits because it's included in the, in the means test. So by, by focusing on these packages, on these net disposable income rather than on the base rates, we feel that we get a better idea of how well uh, people at minimum income protection are protected. Um, so we have been uh, maintaining this data set since uh, 1992. Um, and what it actually shows, uh, so uh, most recently, is that uh, relative to the at risk of poverty thresholds, minimum income protection packages um, are for all the hypothetical households for which we, we do these calculations, um, not adequate. So they are below the at risk of poverty thresholds in most EU member states, with the exception uh, for few member states at some point in time for some hypothetical households. So it's basically most often the case for the Netherlands and Denmark, unsurprisingly. Um, so, um, in terms of trends, what we see when we compare um, these relative minimum income protect protection packages over time as a percentage of the at risk of poverty thresholds, uh, then we find that uh, uh, for the 1990s, and for that uh, time we only have uh, results for the uh, Western European countries, then we find that in the 1990s there was a quite general erosion of uh, means as minimum income protection packages. So that for most countries for which we have data at the time, um, the, the benefits decreased and decreased quite substantially, actually. Um, from 2000s onwards, this is far less pronounced. Then there was still some erosion, but it was far more gradual. And also individual country experiences uh, differed quite a lot. So it was an average, uh, relatively limited erosion relative to the welfare. Uh, to the living standards in society, but the um, individual country experiences differed a bit. So you could have uh, in the 2000s uh, for some years that some countries saw an erosion, but afterwards that they um, had some catch up growth. Um, anyway, the result at this moment is that means as minimum income protection packages, when we take account of all rights based, be rights -based benefits, are inadequate and are generally really inadequate. So most countries uh, find their minimum income protection packages between 60 and 80% of the at risk of poverty threshold. 
and then there's also still a large group uh, with net disposable income even lower than this 60 percent um, in terms of uh, the number of recipients um, this is not something that we uh, track ourselves at the center for social policy but that uh, i have uh, looked up at the ocd data set um, and there uh, it is not surprising that we find relatively low uh, recipiency rates. So at most, it was 3% of the uh, working age population uh, in most countries that was covered by uh, minimum income protection. Now, of course, that's not surprising. It is a residual scheme. It only kicks in uh, after people have, ext uh, have extinguished all their rights to other benefits. And if they fail to, um, if they fail to, to um, to, to find uh, employment or means for themselves at, at the labor market. So there are good reasons why it's so limited, uh, but still 3% is, is not a lot. That also means that in terms of coverage, in terms of the number of the poor who are actually covered by minimum income protection, this is something that uh, Alessandro Nardo has uh, calculated. Uh, he's looking into this uh, for a new paper that we are currently working on, looking at, at the coverage uh, and targeting of, of minimum income protection in the EU member states, uh, that in terms of coverage, uh, it's quite low. So uh, only around 20% of the poor in EU member states actually receive a minimum income protection benefit. To the extent that they are covered by other benefits, like unemployment benefits, like um, disability pensions, th this shouldn't be problematic. So that's something to look further into, to what extent um, there are still gaps left, or to what extent, I mean, there's still gaps because obviously they are poor, but if we look with more stringent uh, at risk of poverty definitions or material deprivation definitions, uh, to what extent then there are still uh, gaps left in coverage when we take also account of these other benefits. So that's something that we uh, want to look into in the near future. Um, I think I'll leave it with that. <laughs> it's a very, um, very um, well put overview. So thank you for this. Um, and I would now have a question for Daniel because so all member states now have minimum income schemes. But what is their difference um, in policy design, if any? First of all, can I just check? You can hear me, okay? You can. We can hear you. Yes. You can hear me well. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, my apologies to not be able to. Um, be able to participate uh, in Brussels, which was my original intention, but um, it's nice to be here online uh, all the same. So I guess the first point that's worth making is that um, comparative analysis of, of minimum income benefits uh, remains a lot less common than comparisons of other areas of, of social security, though there have been a lot of um, you know, advances in, in recent years, uh, including some significant data infrastructure projects like the one um, that Sarah and her colleagues at, at, at Antwerp are, are leading and, and a few others. And these types of um, initiative obviously focus on aspects of, of policy design or policy effect that can be most easily uh, quantified, um, such as benefit levels, adequacy, coverage, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so what I want to focus on a little bit more is, is more qualitative distinctions uh, between minimum income protection systems that we find in, in Europe. What we actually define as a minimum income scheme is an important consideration in, in this respect. Um, if we follow a definition of minimum income as being on the one hand a means tested social security benefit at household level, uh, and on the other hand aiming to provide um, uh, a socially agreed kind of minimum level of, of income, then we need to include in our definition not just uh, last kind of general last resort safety net schemes, what we call social assistance, sometimes, but also categorical means tested social security benefits that are targeted on particular population groups. So um, the unemployed, uh, long term sick and, and disabled, low income working households, lone parents, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, general schemes of last resort social assistance have historically tended to be uh, administered on kind of local or municipal level and operate usually in harness with social services provision, and are at least partly financed out of um, local taxation, albeit within um, a national regulatory framework. Categorical means-tested benefits, uh, by contrast, are more typically 
nationally governed and, and financed and more self-evidently integrated within kind of national social security schemes or, or national social security policies. Now the role played in European um, systems of minimum income protection by these different types of, of benefits varies quite a lot uh, across countries, even if we just compare EU member states which have kind of long established and well institutionalized minimum income protection. So typically in the Nordic countries, minimum income protection has been organized through general last resort social assistance schemes uh, with a strong role for municipalities, while in countries like the Ireland, also the UK, an ex-EU member state now, of course, um, uh, normally they've relied more on categorical uh, means-tested schemes that are a kind of integral part of national social security systems and, and are governed and financed uh, nationally. Continental European countries, France, Germany, Belgium, historically combined a little bit these two uh, approaches with some national categorical schemes compensated by uh, a last resort social assistance scheme, usually with a relatively strong localized element. So the question is why these kind of broad institutional differences actually matter. Um, well, for researchers, first of all, they complicate quite a lot the task of um, very straightforwardly assessing adequacy or coverage in general terms. In a lot of countries, the social minimum is going to be quite different for different uh, population groups. This is why the approach at, at Antwerp of using typical households is, 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 is a good way of, of proceeding in, in this respect. From the perspective of policy reform, secondly, we really need to be aware that we're dealing with policies. When we talk about minimum income protection, we're dealing with policies that are kind of conceptualized and institutionalized in very different ways in different member states. So in many respects, these are fundamentally different types of policy, even if they contribute to um, some kind of similar objectives in terms of, of poverty. So whether minimum income is institutionalized as a, a kind of largely local responsibility within a national regulatory framework or instead nationally financed or organized is going to dictate to what extent reforms um, activate conflicts around central local relations, for example, open up possibilities for kind of cost shifting um, dynamics across different levels of, of governance. Finally, the way that minimum income protection is institutionalized also kind of shapes the possibility frontier, so to speak for how these policies can be coordinated with other, other areas of, of, of social and, and labor market policy, uh, which is maybe something we can come back to um, later on. And um, finally, it's perhaps worth mentioning another important distinction uh, of a very broad brush kind, which is between those countries where the national commitment to minimum income protection is very solidly institutionalized. So typically the countries of, of Western and Northern Europe and those countries where it's much more weakly institutionalized. So this is countries of Central and Eastern Europe and, and Southern Europe. Now, this is a distinction that's tended to attenuate a little bit in, in recent years, particularly because those countries where um, a general last resort means tested scheme was entirely missing have, have begun to implement some reforms and some new schemes in this area. So countries like Italy and, and Greece, but still significant differences remain. So in Central and Eastern Europe, Minimum income protection is typically institutionalized as a general last resort scheme like in, in the Nordic countries, but minimum income benefit levels are much, much lower as a proportion of, of average wages in Central and Eastern Europe than they are in, in Nordic countries. And while member states in Central and Eastern Europe and in Nordic countries both have quite low social assistance caseloads, in the first case, so in Central and Eastern Europe, this is because uh, eligibility criteria for last resort social assistance are still very, very restrictive. While in the Nordic countries, it's more because highly encompassing social insurance, as well as employment friendly family policies, um, play a role that prevents people having to rely on social assistance in, in the first place. So this reminds us of a, of a last, if somewhat obvious point, which is that uh, cross national differences in the operation of minimum income schemes are not only about the design of, of minimum income policies as such, but also about the kind of protectiveness and enabling capacities of the wider welfare state edifice that they're that they're located in. Brilliant! Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, uh, if, if if you would like to perhaps move on to the European level, and I think I have a similar question for Kaina and Ilaria. So, Ilaria, if you if you would like to to go first, 
what actions has the European Union taken so far? Thank you, thank you, Bianca. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think that uh, in order to address this question, it's important to uh, put forward a sort of, uh, let's say, a disclaimer uh, with regard to uh, EU action, because uh, as we all know, uh, the direct action at the supranational level in the field of anti-poverty policy is highly uh, constrained, as said by the uh, by the treaties, which limit uh, EU's prerogatives in this uh, in this policy field. <laughs> Moreover, we have to consider that uh, also member states tend to be highly reluctant to give up uh, power and part of their social sovereignty and uh, autonomy uh, in such a highly uh, symbolic policy, uh, policy field. Uh, despite this uh, consideration, uh, EU action in the field of anti-poverty policy uh, has developed over time, and especially since the uh, 90s, and this uh, occurred along at least, uh, I would say, three main uh, directions. The first uh, is um, that of uh, agreeing on a set of common uh, principles of shared uh, values at the EU uh, level. And this happened uh, through constitutional law and uh, primary, uh, primary law. Uh, let's mention Article 3 of the uh, treaty, uh, which uh, acknowledges that uh, fi the fight against the, uh, social exclusion is among the Union's uh, objectives, or uh, the um, Charter of Fundamental Rights, and in particular Article 34, or uh, more recently, even though in the form of uh, a non-legally uh, binding, yet highly uh, symbolic uh, and uh, fruitful or productive uh, uh, political act, the European Pillar of Social, uh, of social Rights uh, was Principle 14, uh, states that everyone lacking sufficient resources has the right to adequate uh, minimum income. Uh, so the first line of action is that of uh, setting and sharing common principles and uh, values at the uh, supranational uh, level. The second line of action uh, concerns the uh, attempt, at least, uh, at establishing and uh, consolidating uh, over time a, a EU-specific uh, framework uh, of, uh, and, and tools aimed at uh, strengthening and uh, orientating the um, member states as national strategies against, uh, against poverty. And this uh, happens uh, primarily uh, via uh, policy coordination. Mm -hmm. Policy coordination and uh, through uh, the setting of, uh, of targets uh, and through uh, monitoring and uh, benchmarking. Here we can refer to the Council recommendation of 1992 on sufficient resources or the uh, Commission recommendation of 2008 on active, uh, active inclusion to uh, European Parliament resolutions uh, and uh, also uh, policy uh, coordination through uh, the target set uh, within the uh, Europe 2020 strategy for 2020, or uh, now, more recently, uh, the um, uh, action plan of the uh, European Pillar of Social uh, Rights, setting a target uh, for the reduction uh, of poverty um, in, uh, 2000, um, for 2030. Uh, but also, uh, we have uh, guidance within the European semester, including the uh, adoption of country-specific uh, recommendations in the field of uh, social inclusion and uh, the fight against, uh, against poverty. And uh, finally, and this is my, uh, my last point, the third uh, line of action uh, concerns EU directly funded uh, programs in the field of uh, poverty or uh, uh, with the uh, aim of poverty uh, mitigation. Um, this happens through uh, European social funds uh, programs, uh, but also through uh, other specific uh, instruments, uh, such as, uh, for instance, the Fund for European Aid to the Most uh, Deprived. Uh, let me spend just a, a few words on this program because um, his, uh, it, this program has an uh, intriguing uh, history and uh, an intriguing, uh, I think, legacy. Uh, I have no time to go into details, but the program was uh, initially launched uh, in the late uh, 80s uh, under the uh, Delors Commission 
uh, within the common agricultural uh, policy. And this was meant uh, to distribute uh, intervention stocks coming from agricultural uh, policy. Uh, Jacques Delors uh, himself uh, uh, described the uh, adoption of the uh, food ed, uh, program for the most deprived as a coup d'etat by, uh, by, the, by the commission. And uh, in fact, the history of this uh, program that in uh, 2014 was renamed uh, under the name of FIAD and, and, and reformed represent, uh, in my view, uh, a case uh, in point, a case of uh, supranational uh, activism in a policy field, and namely the fight against poverty and social uh, exclusion, which is uh, particularly uh, unlikely to be uh, Europeanized, as it was said, uh, said before. Also for the uh, uh, main features and the uh, heterogene uh, heterogeneity uh, across member states that Daniel Clegg was uh, describing uh, before. Well, in 2019, according to the last figures provided by the uh, Commission, more than 12 million people uh, benefited from food aid from this, uh, from this program. 30% were uh, children and uh, about 350,000 tons of food were, uh, were distribu distributed. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, by no doubt, uh, this is a residual, uh, a residual scheme uh, which cannot make uh, a difference in terms of poverty, uh, of poverty reduction, uh, since it provides just uh, basic assistance with a very limited uh, budget. But nonetheless, uh, it's uh, a case in point, uh, as I was saying, in terms of EU uh, action uh, uh, against, uh, against poverty, uh, was um, history and also the uh, turning point in its uh, development uh, are particularly uh, telling about the uh, political uh, dynamics uh, and the uh, tensions that may uh, rise uh, as regards uh, EU action in, in, in combating poverty. Brilliant, thank you so much. And, and Kaina, perhaps you would have something to add here. Um, and maybe if you could uh, shed some light on your opinion if the EU is actually does have the political will to make a minimum income scheme happen well thank you for for your question and um i think my uh, the, the mm -hmm. previous uh sorry the previous speaker was correct to say that um, member states are reluctant to give to the commission the right to pro uh, to to organize and to promote uh social policies um, and anti-poverty strategies. And it's, and, and it's obvious when we look at the EPSR, the European Pillars of Social Rights, um, which are not necessarily right per se, but a list of principles. And they are not legally binding by instrument uh, by the Commission. So that's why we have a, a, a council recommendation and not a directive. Although at the EPN we have produced an expertise, a legal expertise to say why and how uh, the European Commission and Europe in general has um, the, 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 the legal basis for a directive. And this is why at the EPN we are uh, still advocating for a directive. But it's clear to see that um, at the national level, there is um, a, um, not a lot of willingness to have a legally binding instrument because it poses a lot of question. Uh, what kind of um, paradigm are you, uh, each state are going to pose for this minimum income schemes? Uh, we advocate for a right-based approach. And for what we saw from the, con uh, the council recommendation communication so far from the commission is not really a right-based approach. It's an instrument to put people in the job market, which is a completely different story. Um, it's uh, it's um, it, it leads to punish, uh, punitive conditionality, eligible criteria that is not universal, and so on and so forth. So, um, and I, I don't know what the Commission would, um, what was in their mind when they were um, looking at this, uh, or, um, um, designing this, uh, this council recommendation, and maybe we can have a, a longer talk about this uh, specific uh, policy or the specific uh, council recommendation to say. Um, but it's clear to, to when we look at it, there is not a change of mindset when we talk about anti-poverty um, policies, either at the European uh, level or at the national level. It still see that work and no, with, without a discussion about the qualities of work and the working condition is the only way out of poverty. Um, and um, 
and the commission is going that way as well. So in, in how they are intending to measure the quality or not the quality, but the effectiveness of this, um, of any minimum income scheme is to see how many people get out of this minimum income scheme through work. Um, and, to, and the only indicator is the unemployment rate and not necessarily how people are living uh, with their wages. So um, I think, and that is true even after the COVID pandemic, um, and which is a bit, you could have expected that after this huge crisis without, with people out of, uh, out of work for a long time and companies making a lot of profit with the pandemic, uh, we could have expected um, um, some sort of um, willingness to have a um, redistribution um, willing yeah redistribution of resources uh from from through the tax system which is yet not true uh we are not yet talking about taxes uh, tax justice who will finance a minimum income scheme um it's still seen as poverty is just going to be uh resolved through spending how many how much you spend is going to 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 be the only way through uh, to 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 eradicate poverty and not the what we advocate and what we believe at TAPN is poverty is the result of unequal distribution of resources. And the only way to um, eradicate poverty is to look at the redistribution of resources. And still, and, and, and if we have this, um, uh, this way of looking at poverty where you are going to measure um, how much you spend is leading to the end of poverty, for, for example, um, the, the danger of it is to the stigmatization of the poor that or they are getting a lot of money and 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 yet they're still under the poverty threshold or they're still not able to work for example um so i think there is um uh, a, a willingness to to tackle poverty after the pandemic but not a shift of the paradigm that was here before the crisis all these thoughts are going to go back on this <laughs> okay. in, in, in a few minutes. Um, I now have a, another question for Sarah um, on non-take-up rates that are seemingly are a very alarming figure and perhaps you could um, shed some light on this and what factors in your opinion do determine such a high rates of non-take-up rates? Um, okay, yeah, um, as you say non-take-up is a big issue that is especially relevant also for minimum income protection. Um, why is it especially relevant for minimum income protection? Um, I think Daniel already hinted at it because it's a residual scheme that is also uh, in, in a lot of European countries at a very local level uh, with uh, different um, regulations um, that, that's, uh, that, that offers additional hurdles to take up. And I will get back to that later. Um, but the main issue is, of course, well, it's, it's the benefit of last resorts. Uh, for most people, if then there is a problem with non-take-up that people fail to receive their last resort benefits, of course that that is that is important. That is something that you have to address um, in terms of effectiveness of policy of your anti-poverty policy. You cannot expect it to work if the, the policies you design do not reach uh, the intended target groups, and also of course in terms of of people themselves that fail to receive the benefits to which they are entitled. As you say, it's a, it's a big issue. It's a far from marginal phenomenon. So it's a notoriously difficult to measure because you need a lot of things in order to measure non-take up. Uh, you need to know who uh, would be entitled to a benefit. You need to know who actually receives the benefit. And well, administrations usually know who receives the benefit, but knowing who would actually be entitled is a bit more difficult. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, so basically, if you want to measure non-take-up or you want to have estimates on non-take-up, you need data on low incomes uh, that are underreported, that are not always captured well by administrations. You need a model to identify those that would be eligible, and you need actual recipiency rates. So there are a lot of methodological challenges there in trying uh, to figure out how large non-take-up is. And that is perhaps also the reason why we find estimates in a relatively broad range. So we know that in most EU member states, if there are estimates uh, 
about uh, from of non take up they are usually between 40 and 60 percent which is um it has a has a margin of error but still it, it shows that it's not marginal it shows well if 40 to 60 percent of those eligible do not receive a benefit well something is is wrong then um there are a number of of um um well mitigations in a, in a sense if you express that figure as a percentage of the total budget then it's usually lower so it are mainly those who are entitled to smaller benefits that fail to receive them um and uh it's also different between different benefit levels so some countries do succeed in having lower non-take-up rates um and, and some benefits are are better like um if they are more well known uh more aut uh, automated of course then uh, we usually see higher non-take-up rates so because it's such a big issue there has been a lot of research into what drives non-take-up why why actually people do not receive benefits to which they are entitled um, and basically, um, it has uh, been concluded that there are three different levels at which non-take-up uh, is caused. At the first, you have the individual level, uh, the, the determines at the individual level, but also at the administration level and at the policy level, there are uh, hurdles that make sure that people fail to receive benefits. I am uh, consistently saying that non-take-up is that pay people fail to receive benefit instead of not claiming a benefit because when we measure non-take-up in this uh, well fashion that i just described it is difficult to know what uh, whether it's driven by people who fail to make a claim or whether there are uh, errors made at the, at the implementation level it could be that part of this this figure is caused by people who have actually filed a claim but um, for some reasons because um, their assessment, the, the assess, uh, their claim was assessed in a wrong way. They did not receive it. So that's all in in that uh, big ballpark. Usually, therefore, we distinguish between primary non-take up, which is people who fail to make a claim, and secondary non-take up, where something went wrong with the administration. But the end result is, of course, um, similar. Um, anyway, at the individual level, it has been identified that um, likely drivers are uh, process and information costs. So people simply don't know uh, that a benefit exists, uh, let alone that they are entitled to it um, or what they should do to get it. There are process costs. Um, I don't know, uh, most of us will probably have felt a claim for something during their life, um, health insurance, or uh, I don't know. Um, these forms are not always the easiest to fill out. And sometimes they ask for additional forms and they ask for proof that you have incurred some costs. and uh, it, it's not always easy to, to get all the documents at the same uh, time. And this is what's called process costs, and they can be prohibit prohibitive in some cases. Um, if you have very spotty labor market attachment, if you move uh, from one, to, uh, if you often move often, and you have to have documents that uh, prove all these different kind of things, well, get started. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a difficult process. So, these process costs have also been found to be um, a, a huge impediment. Um, other uh, issues that have been noted in the literature are feelings of shame, stigma, um, and um, other uh, issues um, are network effects. So it's easier to take up if well, people can guide you, if, if you know other people who get a benefit, and trigger events. That usually we see that um, people often uh, are a long time in a situation that just bearable, um, basically they would be entitled but because their situation was just manageable they didn't really realize that they would be entitled to a benefit and if then suddenly something happens like a rent increase or a drop in income or a divorce that that's the moment uh, when they actually go to a local welfare agency to actually ask well i, I don't I, uh, it doesn't work anymore and that that's the moment when they file a claim so that there's usually a long waiting period before people actually make this step so that's what's been found in literature. I uh, want to highlight that exactly today, uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, Tim Houdemey, Julie and Julie Janssens, are um, presenting results for Belgium, also here in Brussels, oh, yes. but uh, on a different venue, uh, in which they actually have done all this work uh, to gather data, to make a model uh, for Belgium in order to um, look more closely into uh, 
Belgium, in, in a non take up in Belgium, and they found that about these drivers of non take up, um, that it's mainly these these information costs, these process costs that are really prohibitive. Uh, that stigma doesn't really come into it; it's a far more uh, marginal role, but it's especially like not knowing the benefit and and too uh, arduous claiming process that makes sure that people uh, fail to make a claim or, or cannot uh, get their benefits. Um, also, uh, these trigger events are really important, that these really make sure that people actually uh, set a step. Um, then I also said there's also uh, at the administrative level additional hurdles, and this makes sense. If information and process costs are the most important at the individual level, then how your implementation is actually designed um, can make it harder or can make it easier to file a claim. Um, so, so we sh really should think about how to design these forms, about which forms, which proofs you actually ask from people. And uh, I've done a, a comparative a comparison about practices in, um, in Belgian municipalities together with Juliensis, in which we asked the local welfare agencies, well, um, what are your opening hours? Very practical questions. What are your opening hours? Uh, how many do documents would this person need to show you? Um, and we found huge variation. So here, the local welfare agencies really have some discretion on how they organize this claiming process. Mm -hmm. And we, we did find variation. And if we then know that, well, this actually makes it harder or not, um, well, that's something to, to really think about what could the impact be of that. We still need to look in the future, future how it actually relates to non take up, but still there are indications that there is variation in this claiming and uh, in this process and information costs. Um, also, that these differences between municipalities are not neutral. So we find that um, uh, more left, so municipalities with a more leftist mayor uh, does more outreaching, mm -hmm. has more outreaching implementation practices. Uh, we also found that municipalities with more uh, migrants, a higher migrant population, that there was more effort in, in a community, well, it makes sense, of course, but that there was more effort to communicate in different languages in uh, making sure that uh, the, the information costs were lower. So that that we de do find some uh, variation there driven by uh, political factors, but also by uh, socioeconomic characteristics of the municipality. Um, so also something that we really uh, Want to look further into um, other uh, and then finally um, there's also the policy level uh, which constitutes of course a last hurdle in two ways in one way um, as daniel said it's usually within a more national regulatory framework that these uh, local uh, welfare agencies operate um, this regulatory framework can actually say uh, put regulations forward that make it harder or easier to, to file a claim to make a benefit. Uh, they can detail waiting periods uh, that um, should be respected. Uh, they can uh, put requirements forward regarding the eligibility, uh, regarding the minimal proof that should be asked. So in Belgium, uh, there will be a, a house a home visit uh, that should be done somewhere within this claiming process. They can also add to the insecurity that people have on their future benefits. So, um, if people are, we know that if, if the expected benefit is lower, people will likely not go through all the trouble if it's a lot of trouble. Um, if it's then not really sure whether you are, are entitled or how large your benefit will be, that's an additional impediment. And that is something that's hap it's happening at the policy level, they detail the benefit level. And often they also say, uh, that they also uh, regulate um, who is eligible uh, in, a f in, a fashion, in a sense that is not. Uh, immediately ticked off. So I'm talking here about willingness to work requirements that are very common, um, where people say, well, I'm willing to work, but I have small children, so I'm not do willing to do any work. Will I be eligible for a benefit or not? Uh, the same is true about assets. So I've uh, written a paper together with uh, Sarah Kuipers, Eva Merckx and Jerlene Redist, in which we compared the assets, the wealth criteria in the means test in European member states, and there we found that, um, yeah, that you, of so course, there are means to test and your wealth should be uh, below a certain maximum. Um, and, uh, but in a lot of countries, this is discretionary. So there is a social worker who will decide whether you have too much wealth or not. 
and wealth is relative. It's about the family home and, and having a car. So um, yeah, you don't know it up front. This is at the policy level that these rules are detailed. Um, and of course, this discretionary assessment that requires meetings with a social worker upfront also lengthen the claiming process un until a decision is made. So Brilliant. I'm sorry. Thank you. No, so. it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, I, I think we're just running a little bit over time, so we should keep our answers a bit um, a bit shorter. But thank you so much for for a very complete overview. Um, I, I have a question now now for Daniel. Um, so we know that minimum income schemes are, are residual. So how do they relate to other social protection instruments and services? And perhaps you could also give us um, what improvements can be made in this regard? So because social protection is, is so broad, that's potentially quite a broad question. I mean, one set of issues is about linkages between um, minimum income as such and, and other forms of financial support, um, other types of, of, of benefits. And it partly relates to what Sarah was just saying, I, I, I think, and it's been a major policy question in, in, in a number of countries recently, um, where effectiveness has essentially been designed in relation to, on the one hand, levels of complexity for claimants, and on the other hand, in relation to issues around incentives um, to work. And these two issues, of course, overlap somewhat uh, at the margins. Um, so often, Entitlement to minimum income benefits gives rise to other entitlements. In the UK, we call this passporting um, arrangements, and, and that can be entitlements to very significant things in household budgets like housing, uh, support with housing costs, um, but also more minor things, which are nonetheless very important for people on low incomes like um, free school meals, subsidised transport, uh, all this type of thing. Now, the critique um, that's been around recently of, of this you know, complex arrangements that link different types of entitlement together um, is that on the one hand this requires a lot of time and knowledge for for claimants to know what they're entitled to which they may be helped with in the implementation process but they may not be and that of course enhances risks of, of non-take up of various types of, of entitlement um, and at the same time the impact on this complex set of entitlements of any changes that may happen in the household particularly in terms of entering work or increasing hours of work is very, very opaque, and not least because the rules in terms of how these benefits may be withdrawn with increasing incomes are not um, harmonized. And so this has given rise to one trend that we've seen in minimum income policy, at least in, in some countries recently, and justified by the twin, um, the, the, the kind of twin ideas of simplification on the one hand and making work pay, as it's sometimes called, uh, on the other, has been to try and you know, merge together different types of, of entitlement as far as possible into a single payment um, structure uh, with a single rate of withdrawal as, as, income, um, as income rises. And this has been like the inspiration behind the, the universal credit reforms in the UK, um, but also behind the proposals of the French president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, for the future integration of, of minimum income benefits, which may, may or may not happen. And these types of reforms raise a lot of complex issues um, of a technical variety, but also, of course, of, of, a, of a political variety. Um, a, a somewhat different issue is the relationship between um, minimum income and, and services. Um, and here, of course, the, the EU concept of, of active inclusion, which Ilaria referred to earlier on, developed through a number of communications and, and a recommendation just on the eve of the financial crisis in, in, in 2006-07. Eight, um, act, the active inclusion con concept emphasized the need for minimum income to be better articulated on the one hand with employment um, services and on the other hand with uh, so-called enabling social services of particular relevance to those claimants with more kind of complex individual level barriers to social integration, eventually also to employment uh, as a result of psychosocial problems, addictions, housing problems, issues around health, language deficits and, and all this sort of thing. Um, however, um, the alignment between um, minimum income protection and these different kind of service areas, and here I link back to what I was saying in, in my first uh, intervention, is really shaped by the different ways that minimum income schemes are conceptualized and institutionalized in different uh, EU member states. So in Nordic countries like, like Sweden, minimum income protection, social assistance has always been really closely linked with social services. Social workers are playing an important role in frontline implementation. 
And, and in, in a country like Sweden, the key problem of, of around social assistance claimants has been a kind of deficient alignment of social assistance with uh, various types of, of employment support. Sweden's employment policies are mainly organized in, on the national level, uh, not as local policies, and the, the Swedish Public Employment Service is widely perceived to be less willing to work with social assistance claimants um, even when they're referred to the Public Employment Service by the Social Assistance Office. By contrast, in countries like uh, the UK or Ireland, where uh, minimum income protection is really an integral part of the national social security system, it's the Public Employment Service that routinely administers these types of benefits for all groups that are deemed to be employable, which is more and more working age minimum income claimants uh, these days. So here the alignment with employment policies is, is pretty strong. And it's more the link to enabling um, social services that are more obviously problematic um, as public employment services staff are not social workers. Um, they lack their you know, specialized casework skills and they don't necessarily have as good network of, of kind of local sources of, of social service support. It's not easy to fix these um, kinds of, of problems. There are a, vari a variety of possible solutions, but they all have they all have some weaknesses. So one option, which has been seen in, in, in Sweden um, with local employment policies, also in France with what are called insertion um, policies, is to develop on the local level kind of parallel systems of provision that better serve minimum income uh, claimants in areas where they're under supported, in this case, uh, kind of employment related um, support. The main risk here, of course, is this risk of inefficiencies because you then have Kind of local and national forms of provision in very similar areas, overlapping and potentially even kind of competing with, with each other. Another option is cooperation, kind of multi-level, multi-actor cooperation between the various protagonists in, in, in these policies, the various agencies involved. And this can include things like um, co-location of public employment service staff in social assistance uh, offices or of social workers in, in job centers. Um, and this seems a promising approach, but the evidence we have, which is kind of fragmentary about, about this, is that the success really depends on very localized factors and even sometimes interpersonal factors. So the ability of kind of key people on the ground to work well with each other across agencies. From a kind of institutional point of view, cooperation across organizations can be, you know, can run into problems of the diverging organizational mandates and incentives that the managers of these organizations have, but also the very different kind of attitudes, problem representations, professional cultures of the different um, frontline staff involved. Finally, there are reforms that can kind of more profoundly reallocate responsibilities across different levels of governance. So you might think of the decentralization of the public employment services, or perhaps the nationalization or federalization of, of social assistance, where that's been traditionally a local scheme. And of course, these are possible, but they're very highly disruptive institutional reforms for quite um, uncertain payoffs. And potentially they may even require you know, formal amendments to constitutions. So we saw this in, in Germany with the, the requirement for a constitutional amendment to um, make the new implementation structure uh, that was put in place for implementation of the Hearts reforms um, actually actually legal. So this is this is complicated. I know that Bianca asked me um, about um, uh, improvements. So this is mainly about problems, not so much about solutions. I'm so, sorry for that. Okay, it's okay. Um, a somewhat obvious point perhaps though is that um, adequate resourcing of both social and, and employment policies would be very helpful, if only because we know that, you know, extremely tight budget constraints makes cooperation between organizations that's required to produce kind of joined up packages of support um, a lot more a lot more difficult um, and to the extent that adequate resourcing uh, requires taxpayer consent it would probably also be useful if the you know the emphasis which is legitimate I think on the need to provide minimum income claimants with kind of help to help self-help of various kinds it would be useful if this discourse um, didn't insinuate at the same time that this somehow means that poor people are responsible for their um, situation, as this tends to undermine rather than reinforce uh, taxpayer consent. And the political discourse around, you know, activation of minimum income protection, balancing rights and responsibilities, uh, all this sort of stuff has not always avoided that, that risk in, in recent decades and has often seemed to be as much about 
kind of political positioning um, as, as about the actual policy issues um, involved. One final thing, um, if, if I have time, uh, which, is, which is a little bit different. In a lot of countries, one of the fastest growing um, forms of minimum income protection, especially since the financial crisis, has been support for low income working uh, households. Um, so um, whether that's through general schemes or through you know, categorical dedicated in work benefits. And supporting claimants who are, who are in work financially is a, a good thing, of course, um, but there is a risk here that um, improving in work minimum income protection in combination with labor market deregulation mainly helps kind of normalize precarious employment and institutionalize forms of, of working poverty. And part of the policy response to this, of course, relates to the regulation of the labor market. But within minimum income protection, I think the need for better support for people who are in work to be able then to progress in work. So not just the idea that once you're in work, then, you know, job done and, and people can get on with it. But for people who are in work, get some kind of adequate support for progression. This seems to be one area where, where more, more policy attention is needed within, within minimum income protection policies. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I would like to go back to the European level now. And I have a question both for Ilaria and Karina. And why has the European Commission decided to go for a recommendation instead of a directive. I'm sure this would take much more than five minutes, but <laughs> <laughs> we can try and, and just pack it. Okay. Maybe Lady wants to go first. Go first? Yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, uh, it's a, a, a quite demanding uh, uh, issue. I mean, <laughs> actually, uh, I think that uh, uh, we must uh, refer to, uh, to different uh, aspects. The first is that uh, is not uh, uh, undisputed whether uh, a legally uh, binding uh, tool, a directive uh, uh, on a minimum income can be uh, based on uh, Article uh, 153 of the uh, Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. But more importantly, uh, I think that uh, um, from a political standpoint, we have to consider that the adoption of a binding uh, instruments would be at higher risk of failure because of, uh, of um, uh, cross-cutting uh, vetoes uh, and uh, heterogeneous, highly heterogeneous uh, preferences and understandings about what minimum income is and what minimum income and minimum income protection should, uh, should be. Uh, so the setting of common standards uh, for uh, minimum income would certainly uh, rise uh, harsh tensions. Uh, between and across uh, member states. So pragmatically, uh, I think that uh, a council recommendation uh, is a, a sort of second best option, but still uh, it's um, legally and uh, politically uh, more uh, feasible and also it's uh, a quicker uh, way uh, to uh, proceed to give a, a signal in this uh, in this policy uh, policy field, and I think that uh, a recommendation and a directive uh, are not uh, mutually uh, exclusive. So the uh, recommendation can be uh, seen as a sort of <clears throat> an additional step in a path uh, towards a, a stronger commitment in the uh, in the future in the in the future. Uh, and this is even uh, truer, uh, considering that uh, um, significant uh, shares of uh, uh, public opinion support a stronger social Europe, especially in the field of anti-poverty uh, policies, yet uh, support varies across uh, member states. So I think that our recommendation pragmatically <coughs> can be a first step, and then we have to work in the, uh, in the future to have legally binding uh, measures. Yeah. Okay, now, do you agree? And no, I agree. I agree to say that uh, as civil society organization, we have been advocating for decades for a directive, a legally binding, because we know that soft instrument doesn't, um, they don't uh, provide the, the what we need at the local, at the national level. So, um, and we know that with this commission mandate, we know that there will not be a directive. Um, that the only concern is to implement the EPSR, the European Social Pillars um, uh, Action Plan, throughout until 2024, and uh, we can't have a directive by then. So we see definitely the Council recommendation, as uh, Ilaya said, as a step for uh, as a step towards a directive. 
Um, but it's um, to say why they decided directive, uh, why they decided, uh, fortunately not, uh, why they decided a council recommendation. Uh, I think you need to ask this question to the commission themselves. Um, <laughs> uh, we can have our own opinion and we can have um, our own an, yeah, observation about what they would expect from member state and so on. But um, this is not our role as civil society organization, as civil society um, partners and, and so on. Uh, our role is not to play the game of member state to make sure that there is some sort of policy put forward. Uh, we need to push for what we what we what we need. And definitely um, so far soft instrument non binding instrument has not provided the social protection that people experiencing poverty need and um yeah the the the, the, the legally binding instrument the framework directive is uh for apn not only something that as expert as policy expert we've been advocating but it's also coming from the ground from people experiencing poverty from the people that we work with and the people we amplify um, who we amplify the voices, they are asking at the national level and at the European level a legal instrument um, for a direct uh, for minimum income scheme. Um, so I think our work is not done. Um, but the good point is, or the silver lining is, uh, with this uh, council recommendation, we see that there is at the EU level, but also with social, uh, with partners, uh, with other organizations, there is more interest in minimum income. Uh, EAPN has been working on minimum income since its creation 30 years ago. And now we see more and more people, more and more organization, uh, equality network, and um, whether at the European level, or even at national level, who see minimum income as not only as an instrument for stronger social protection, but also as a um, channel to discuss and challenge how we understand anti-poverty strategies. Um, the fact that, like I said earlier, the fact that we are talking about a right-based approach really question the, 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 um, the, the economic paradigm that we are now living in, in Europe. And uh, what does it mean to have a social Europe? What does it mean to have a, a social contract um, with, uh, with 27, 26, I don't know how many uh, we are going to be, um, um, member states? Um, so, yeah, I think there is a willingness uh, to, to move forward with, uh, with instruments that are uh, providing the, the necessary protection. Um, it's just that the, the work is not done yet. That's it. I think we're running a little bit late, so I would actually take a, a different route to the one that we planned, and I'll keep the questions that I've prepared just on hold, and I'll see if in the room we have one round of questions so that we make sure that um, if there are questions that you want to get answered, you get the chance to do that. And if anyone wants to raise their hand and you could quickly introduce yourself, um, and yeah, I'll just pass on a mic. Do we have questions? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the speakers. Great, great interventions. Um, Mattia from Mentoring Europe and PP graduate uh, in a year time now. Um, I was curious on opening a bit of a debate on to what extent you see the minimum income right now happening towards a social democratic reform. So working within the system and, you know, putting plasters on the systems rather than a more emancipatory direction, which I think Karina was, Karina, right, uh, was more uh, aiming at. So would, to what extent Europe as a role in, uh, you know, pushing for a minimum income towards emancipatory paradigm of economic, you know, and social security, rather than keep pushing for uh, social democratic and very uh, reformist reforms. Big question. Up to you. Do you want to tackle it? it? We can try. <laughs> um, and in terms of literature, I'm referring to um, Goofman and Peter Frey, so to what extent we can go towards that, that direction? 
start. Go ahead. I can start answering the question, um, but of course it's a it's a larger debate. And um, from the reason why I think minimum income scheme is really um, central in how we understand social policies and social um, protection. Um, it really because it's it question when we talk about accessibility, for example, who has the right to minimum income scheme? And one of the question is um, one of the, the accessible accessibility criteria is residency, for instance. Uh, is it a, a citizen based uh, social protection or um, and if not, if migrants have the right to social protection, to what extent? Uh, how long do they need to stay in a country to have uh, access to minimum income scheme? which question at the end the migration policies that we have uh, third country national are they entitled to social protection in europe or not so it questioned the migration policies in one hand uh, when we um, when uh, sarah were mentioning um, stigmatization um, and I, I, I trust the, the, um, the, the result of the policies, but I, I would like to also question uh, what we, when we talk about stigmatization, is um, racialized minority in the same, um, uh, stigmatized the same way when they have access to minimum income scheme or social protection in general. So it really asks what are the places some in our society for some uh, minorities, for instance. Um, Earlier, we were mentioning the, the fact that uh, minimum uh, income is a pathway to work. And uh, Daniel was also uh, mentioning the fact that once people have work, that's it, um, our job is done. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's a way, uh, is minimum income a way to mitigate in work poverty? Or um, question why people prefer or, we, or, or, or what is the, 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 the initiative to work? if they are going to be to still remain poor uh, in work and also the the and maybe here i'm more radical than my organization but um we tend to think that uh, minimum income should be at the poverty threshold and if you want to move upward then you need to work why <laughs> why do you need to work to be to be able to just afford a decent life um when we ha we know that work is is um exploitative <laughs> to say the least um so it, it really is this question of what do we put forward and as an organization we are um uh discussing with policymakers so we need to be audible we need to speak the same language as them and we need to put forward this uh, um um recommendation that are accessible and and also to build victories that if you ask um if if you advocate for recommendation that you know are not going to, going to put forward, then you are demoralizing your own troops, so to speak. Um, so you need to to speak the same language, but also you you, you have you need to uh, walk the line between being here to challenge, but also being able to play the game. So it's a really cost benefit uh, a, a game that you need to play at all time um but at the, it's just where is where is the line where where is the, the 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 line that you will not cross uh when we when we discuss um social protection and social right um in in that case and um yeah it's it's i think this is why apn has worked so much on minimum income uh really because it really questioned what kind of society we want what kind of protection we want and um as long as we didn't reach the 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 yeah the the, the redistribution of resources that I, I was mentioning earlier the just redistribution of resources and at the end it also question um why for example in in the covid pandemic in countries where um uh, growth has been yeah, we, we've known growth from for many decades and we have been uh, experimenting um, uh, productivity gains. If you do not work, then you can't pay your rent. And people are still uh, bargaining between rent, uh, energy price, energy cost, uh, food and so on, even when they work. Um, so yeah, I think the, 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 the really, your, your, your question is really, really, um, to the point of what we try to to achieve. Thank you. And is there anyone else that would like to jump in this question? Otherwise, I think we have another question 
in the audience. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so thank you. It's it's a, a very uh, sensitive uh, issue. I think that has uh, was saying uh, that minimal income uh, questions our view of of, of society. And echoing uh, Stefan Leibfried, uh, we could say that social assistance is a, a privileged terrain uh, to assess the uh, very essence of social uh, social protection in in uh, 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 in a system. Uh, so I think that uh, it's important to uh, consider uh, minimum income has a, a, a test, as a case in in point. But at the same time, it's not enough to look just at uh, minimum income because it uh, its impact. Um, heavily uh, depends on the interplay with the other tires of the social protection uh, system. So family benefits, unemployment and uh, active employment policies and so on and so forth. So it's a, a, a complex uh, uh, synergy uh, between uh, different uh, elements that um, can uh, help us to understand the uh, impact, the effects of this kind of, uh, of measure. Thanks. Thanks, Julia. Thank you very much. Um, we can have the mic. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Noah Oder. I'm from the German Federal Employment Agency. And I have a question, um, I think, to the whole panel, actually, that is a bit connected to, to what has been said already. Um, you know, when we talk about like innovative strategies to fight inequality in the scientific literature, there is often this juxtaposition of a universal, ba universal basic income versus a job guarantee program where the state acts like as an employer of last resort. And I was just curious what your thoughts on that would be, would be and if they would be able to successfully fight inequality or if it's just something that sounds good in theory but doesn't really work out that well in practice. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Thank you very much. Maybe, Daniel, you would want to take this first? Um, if, if Yeah, I can say something. It's uh, a little a little beyond my, my domain of, of, of expertise. I mean, of course, it's an interesting... It's an interesting um, debate. I mean, kind of radical alternatives to the social protection arrangements that we've kind of uh, that have you know built up by accretion over time in European countries, which have, after all, the best levels of of, of social protection anywhere in the world, and they're mainly organised around social insurance, um, which is a kind of handmaiden handmaiden of you know, competitive um, labor markets, and then undergirded to a greater or lesser extent, as we've heard here, by various types of, of, of kind of targeted uh, anti-poverty policies. Would, um, you know, would outcomes be better if we move to a radically different approach, which is, you know, either on the one hand, um, the introduction of universal basic income, which would almost certainly entail a falling away of a lot of the higher tiers of, of social insurance, provision, uh, or on the other hand, an employer of, you know, last resort approach, which would then have serious implications for the way that the, the, the labor market organizes and operates. Um, in relation to the first one, I'm universal basic income. I'm personally far from convinced um, that uh, a universal basic income approach would um, bring the benefits that lots of its advocates claim that it would bring. Um, there's the issue of political feasibility, which I think is is, is obviously a slightly different issue. Um, but I think, you know, in the current context, the, uh, although the debate around universal basic income has, of course, been sparked a lot, um, not least by the, the, the pandemic, um, I think the political conditions for the implementation of universal basic income still don't look like um, still don't look like they're um, they're there um, in terms of a job guarantee program and this is an idea that that surfaces every now and then and of course within active labor market programs it's been um approximated to by some countries in particular um historical periods you know the large use of of non-market uh, employment large non-market um uh programs um their evaluation um results have have always been very bad but of course they were implemented in 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 a particular context and, and probably wouldn't have all the features that a job guarantee program would have so i you know i can say less uh, less about that i i think but 
and this then maybe partly relates to the previous question. I mean, maybe it's because I'm living in 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 the UK and in Scotland, and we've had uh, in Scotland twelve years now of conservative um, government that we haven't voted for in in Scotland. Um, and you know, for me, social democratic reformism in that context looks quite attractive. So, some of the instruments of social democratic reformism, I'd, I'd be I'd be willing to give them a bit more of a try. I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, I have a question. Can I, can I yeah, jump that? in. Go ahead. Yes, Sorry. for sure. Um, it's interesting because um, every time we talk about minimum income, we have this question about universal basic income. Yeah. So it's um, the, the, how it's diverting the, the issue. It's um, really says a lot about this instrument, I think. Um, that's my first uh, point. Uh, why not reinforcing what we have as, as a model of social protection? Why inventing a new one? And I think the reason why we want to invent a new one, and I think um, it's um, this idea of basic, uh, universal basic income is uh, you give a certain amount of people and the rest is left to the market. Mm -hmm. Health, uh, education, uh, energy, everything else is left to the market, and then uh, household dis uh, households decide um, how they are going to pay, what kind of choices they want to make. Um, this is far, 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 far from the social protection that we have now. Um, because social protection is not only about the benefits that we have, it's also about the kind of services that we have, affordable quality services that the state should provide, and it's not left to the market. Um, and also it's... Um, the fact that liberals uh, are in favor of this uh, universal basic income in, in France, for example, or in elsewhere is also um, says a lot about who uh, will benefit the most from this. Uh, to shift away um, the, 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 the right to this income, to, 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 how can I say, it, it tends to, um, we, what, we can uh, what we can anticipate is that it, it will tend to demobilize the, um, struggle the, the the conflict between between um workers and their employers uh, because as long as you have a minimum income then you're not entitled to predict, to to have a redistribution to productivity gain mm -hmm. the employers will still benefit take profit um but you have a ba you have a, a basic income to 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 um sustain yourself um so I think it's um, it's a uh, it's a false ally in this uh, in this um, uh, in in our field of work, um, and if it's not what uh, I think it is, then it's minimum income. Then we don't need necessarily a <laughs> universal basic income. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for for both of you for answering this question. Um, I have a question for Sarah that is slightly off piece what we've discussed before in the coffee break, um, but we haven't really touched upon the pandemic at all uh, in, in the panel today. And perhaps you could um, give us a few pointers on how COVID has shaped or has heightened the need for encompassing minimum income schemes. And perhaps also you could also say a few words on inflation. So if there are minimum income schemes in Europe that are indexed, um, and which countries uh, does it happen, if any? Uh, yes, I, I know this all by heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, regarding the pandemic, um, I've been doing a lot of research on, on um, how it was actually coped with in Belgium. Um, and uh, of course, we see that there has been some similar recipes in other EU countries. Um, what we see is that basically there was a uh, very swift response uh, supporting the incomes of those that were affected by, by the lockdown. And then with those that were affected, I mean in a very strict labor market sense. Like if people um, lost their job, became temporary unemployed, then we saw that there was a very uh, large uh, yeah, battery of, of measures of, of income support that was targeted at them. Um, which made sense in a way, because it was very visible that that uh, there was additional support needed there. Uh, but those who are already were on minimum income protection there, it was uh, less swift. Um, so we saw there actually uh, insiders were quite well protected. Also that, especially in Belgium, that this temporary employment scheme that we had, uh, that is actually 
well, was, was quite generous, did, did a job in, in supporting incomes, at least uh, in the short term. Um, at the same time, uh, we noted from, from food banks, from local welfare agencies, that there was also an increased demand of people who were not covered by these uh, social insurance schemes. Um, and this uh, was to some extent new. Uh, we saw here actually uh, very clearly what uh, we suspected, but was usually more piecemeal, like that uh, flexibilization of the labor markets uh, and new forms of employment that is actually leads to more people who are not covered by unemployment. Uh, but usually it's, it's not that visible, but if they all lose their, their work at the same time, then of course we see a spike in, in demands at local welfare agencies uh, for people who are not entitled to other benefits. So there we see that there are more claims uh, for uh, social assistance, swifter also. We usually see in a crisis more claims of social assistance, but it's usually uh, a few months in, not immediately. And we also saw uh, more people at, at uh, food banks. And because this was visible in such a sense, there was uh, a, a, a slower reaction, but still there was a reaction uh, that increased also uh, the budget for local welfare agencies to provide more discretionary support. Um, we saw that NGOs uh, took up a lot of the work. And then, uh, and this happened in most uh, EU member states, or at least in a lot of EU member states, that by the summer, so with a few months um, uh, delay, uh, we see that then also at the, there were uh, additional uh, lump sum benefits also introduced in the minimum income protection schemes um, as a reaction to uh, a growing needs, also as a reaction to, to advocacy of, of NGOs um, that, that noted these increased lines at food banks that also saw, well, um, okay, these people did not become unemployed, they had the same income, but at the same time, we see empty shelves in, in supermarkets, we see that uh, you have, you can no longer choose for the, sh the cheapest option, um, because, yeah, suddenly you had to buy pasta uh, from the, the supreme, uh, the premium uh, brand, because it was the only thing that was left, and, and that was all okay if you had uh, enough income, enough margin to, to take that. If not, then there was not really another option. Um, so as a reaction to that, to that advocacy, also we see there lump sum benefits increasing uh, and also uh, a lot of additional support through the child benefit system. Whether that actually ended up with people uh, on minimum income protection benefits depends, of course, on how the means test works. Um, then uh, regarding inflation, <laughs> Uh, no, um, so a while back, but um, we checked the, but, but this is really years ago and was in a context of, of um, inflation that was far uh, less pronounced. Uh, we checked uh, the uh, inflation uh, in the indexing me mechanisms that existed uh, in the EU member states. Um, and then uh, we found, um, as far as I remember, that there are, um, are different groups like some are indexed against price inflations some have indexation even with wages that follow minimum wage uh, or through der derivation of the minimum wage um, i think um no i'm not sure there was one country where it was linked to the social pension but then the social pension was linked to the minimum wage so in some way they try to follow uh, wage developments um and also mix mixtures like uh the the most generous are the, are the average increase in prices in wages in order to have some link with welfare. So there definitely is around half of the EU member states at that time had such an indexation mechanism. In others, was completely absent. So there it was really ad hoc government decisions that actually decided about, upon uh, further uh, indexation. Um, what we saw at the previous crisis, uh, 2007, 2008, 2010, is that um, there was indexation and that uh, there was a lot of additional lump sum benefits uh, immediately after the crisis but that afterwards in the austerity times indexation was skipped quite a few times because it's a less feasible way of retrenchment than actually cutting benefits so that's something that um, I, is to keep an eye on but in the current context of, of advocacy and, and uh, challenges related to uh, price increases, I don't think that uh, will be immediately on the table. But now the question is, is how to make sure that, that benefits in those countries that don't have such an automatic indexation mechanism will actually follow these, these price increases with the additional challenge that um, general indexation mechanisms might not suffice as well 
uh, because they are usually following a, a general index, uh, an average index, uh, whereas now it either energy prices um, and, and, and really the, the um, very basic needs that are increasing more in price and the more luxur luxurious expenses that take down the average. So whether that actually uh, suffices for people at, at the, um, with lower incomes who have to spend most of their income on, on uh, necessities. Thank you so much. Daniel, perhaps if you have um, anything to add on this? Yeah, very briefly, because I, I know we don't have uh, so much time um, remaining. Yeah. I mean, I think the current context is, is really interesting in terms of minimum income protection policy, because you do in fact have, um, you do in fact have this, you know, this really strong inflation, which has made issues of indexation of benefits and these kind of questions much more salient than they've been for a long time. I mean, this is now being talked about regularly in, uh, you know, not just by by NGOs and think tanks, but in in kind of national newspapers, how how benefits are going to be adjusted in 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 the face of of this um, of this big shock. So the kind of um, you know the the the, the resilient risk resilience function of minimum income protection schemes uh, and also the consumption function of them um, is, is, is remaining present. And I think it, that came a little bit during the, the, the pandemic um, a bit too. I mean, there's been obviously this emphasis, which was mentioned earlier on kind of uh, activation, uh, rights and responsibilities, getting people into work, you know, for a long time in minimum income policy for, for decades now. Um, and that kind of got suspended for very obvious reasons during the, the the pandemic because you know people needed to get money quickly. There were no job opportunities, and you know there were there were public health reasons that people couldn't be um, couldn't be expected. So so that was kind of that that paradigm was kind of suspended, um, and a different kind of paradigm sort of emerged. And the inflation issue is keeping it keeping it salient to some extent. What's also happening though, and that's a bit um, you know that's pushing in the other direction. Is that because of the big labour shortages that are being seen in in particular sectors in in some countries, then the question of incentives to work is also coming back very strongly. So you get both these discourses going on. You know, we need to reduce minimum income benefits because you know people there are job shortages. There are people who want jobs. You know, what's the problem here? It must be the fault of the benefits. This discourse is coming back, and at the same time, an emphasis on indexation, increasing the value of of, of benefits. So it'll be very interesting, I think, to see how this plays out. In different countries over the next um, uh, over the next year or, or or two, the only other thing I would say is that I mean in the UK we have, and again that's salient at the moment, we have for pensioners so for the basic state pension an indexation mechanism called the triple lock, um, which uh, basically guarantees um, that pensions will be um, will be indexed in line with the most the highest of three different measures of of inflation. Um, so this is the the, the Conservative government are, are very attached to it because because the the grey vote is very attached to it and they are seeking that grey vote, but it seems to me that a triple lock style mechanism. I mean, the current context has shown that that kind of mechanism would be very helpful actually in in um, minimum income protection as 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 a general approach. So maybe we can. I mean, I think indexation is an interesting is an interesting issue and 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 trying to encourage kind of best practice in this area is 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 probably something useful. Perfect. Thank you so much. And, and maybe um, Ilari, you would like to add something yes, on that? Yes, may I, may I uh, step in? Because uh, I, uh, I um, agree with uh, the um, comments and the remarks by Karina, Sarah and, and Daniel. Uh, but all this uh, consideration brings me to think that it's important to stress that if you really want to uh, contrast inequality, uh, focusing on redistribution is not uh, is not enough. I mean, we have also to consider pre-distribution measures able to impact uh, on market uh, on market outcomes. Uh, for instance, through labor market regulation and the uh, minimum wage is uh, or can be, uh, let's see, a move in this uh, in this direction. Right. And I think we have just two minutes, but Kena, if you, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, adding to your point and, and Daniel's point, of course, uh, this also brings the issue of, of in not only indexing of benefits, but also indexing and, and wages and making sure that they um, keep up with living standards or also the low wages that, that uh, 
months, I think. I think it's, there is an automatic indexation after mm-hmm. every two years. So mm-hmm. we'll see how that is going to be implemented <laughs> in, in national legislation. Um, Kaina, do you have maybe a few words to say? Um, on the indexation, I think it's um, it going back to what we index on, on the basis of um, of this bad sketch of good. Uh, what do we include in that? Um, and I think in this point, there is two, two things that I would like to say. First is um, the participation of people uh, in this process. Uh, we can't have only experts deciding what is to determine what is a decent life um, and have only the necessary good included in this uh, baskets of good. And um, and also the the the, the s- when you index, you also have to take into account um, the if you have one indexation per year, and we know that prices are going to rise again and again and again. So even the the mechanism of how you index should be also um, uh, real, checked by the reality as well. Thank you very much. I think this is. Um, um, we don't have any time left today, but uh, thank you for everyone that has been listening both online and in person. Those online have seen that throughout the session, they have been bombarded by links with paper that you have all written and also all of the policy statements of EAPN. Um, and for those of you that are in the room, you'll be able to find them in, in, in our website. There is a link to all of the literature so that you can go and check that out. And a big, big thank you to, to the speakers. Thank you so much for for everyone that has been able to to join us both um, here in Brussels and online. Thank you.